So let's talk about complexity. For a codebreaker who spent all day decrypting messages and unlocking secrets, knowing what kind of cipher was used makes puzzling out the answer a lot easier. But the vast machine of everyday communication didn't come with any blueprints. We need to work extra hard to try to reverse engineer language into its component parts to get out just how complicated a system it really is. So what do we find when we finally crack the code? I'm Moti Lieberman and this is the Link Space. Welcome to the Ling Space. Any language can be broken up into different systems. Syntax, semantics, morphology, phonology, and different languages divvy up the workload in different ways. But linguists generally agree that, on the whole, all languages are equally capable of expressing pretty complicated ideas. But what about human language overall? Just how complex is it, and how do we even measure that? To get to the bottom of things, we'll need to hone in on what language actually is. As we've touched on before, one thing that we can rule out pretty much right away is the idea that a language is just a bunch of sentences, pre-built and ready to be pronounced. If that were true, each of us would need an infinite memory to carry them all around in our heads. That's because, in principle, there's no upper limit on how many sentences there are, or even how long each one can be. Like, take the sentence, Joan should be allowed to work at Bletchley Park. We can always add a few words to the beginning of it and still end up with a perfectly good sentence. Like in, Alan thinks that Joan should be allowed to work at Bletchley Park. And there's nothing stopping us from doing that again, and again, and again. So it doesn't seem very likely that we've just got all these possible sentences memorized ad infinitum, especially since you've probably never even heard most of them before, but you still recognize them as English. Instead of a list, language is more like a set of rules encoded in our heads, which we can tap into at any moment to produce any sort of sentence we like. And we've seen these rules in action before. When we talked about x-bar theory, we showed you the sorts of trees that we use to represent the structures of sentences, and at the roots of these trees are the rules that generate them. Take a sentence like, Christopher might help, which looks like this. Underneath this lies a couple of rules, which can be put together and fed into each other. These say that a sentence, or inflectional phrase, can be made up out of a noun phrase, plus some indication of tense or modality, plus a verb phrase. There's a lot of different kinds of rules we can come up with to show how elements come together, different combinations that encode any linguistic system. But how complex do the rules need to be to fully capture actual human language? Depending on the answer, we can get an idea of how complex natural language really is compared to other systems, like the artificial languages that we program computers with. That's because once we can nail down the kinds of rules we need to account for it, we can fit them into the Chomsky hierarchy, named after linguist Noam Chomsky. The Chomsky hierarchy is like a ranking of different types of rules, along with the different kinds of languages they're able to generate. The rules at the very bottom of the hierarchy form what are called type 3 grammars, with more sophisticated rules showing up the higher you go on the list, all the way up to type 0. It's like golf, where smaller numbers score higher. So where does natural language fit? Well, Let's start with the simplest possible grammars, the type 3s, and see if it fits there. These work using rules that look a bit like this. That first rule works by outputting some word in the language you want to generate, followed by a placeholder which can be filled in with more words later on. So this rule could start by producing something like if phrase. Then we can apply the rule again to replace that phrase part with another word, followed by yet another phrase. So we get if you phrase, if you pass phrase, and so on. We can keep going like this as long as we like, until we get to the end of our sentence and apply our second rule. It says that we can fill in that last bit with just one word, so we can get, if you pass the Turing test, then you're conscious. The sort of language generated by a type 3 grammar is known as a regular or finite state language. Since we managed to get our rule to produce an English sentence, maybe English is a finite state language. But as you probably guessed, it isn't quite that simple. For one, the number of ifs in a sentence like that usually has to match the number of then. So you can't have sentences like, if, if you pass the Turing test, then you're conscious, or you pass the Turing test, then, then, then you're conscious. And our rules are too simple to account for that, to let you stack things up wrong or give you garbled results. Now, there is a bit of flexibility here, and with the right amount of tinkering, we could probably debug our rules and sidestep these specific cases, but the problem only gets worse. Since any clause in a finite state grammar can be replaced with any other clause of the same sort, we can replace the first half of that sentence with something like, either you pass the Turing test or you have a mind. So the end result winds up as, if either you pass the Turing test or you have a mind, then you're conscious. And again, nothing's stopping us at just one swap. So we can also get a sentence like, if either you pass either the Turing test or a psychological exam, or you have a mind, then you're conscious. 
In general, you need as many ORs as there are either. There's really no room for error. This is working so far with a lot of effort, but it looks like we really need some kind of counter to keep track of how many ifs and eithers we use, or the rules might just start giving us nonsense. Our grammar needs some kind of memory, which a type 3 grammar just doesn't have. So what about the next level up, type 2? Well, these grammars give us a lot more flexibility. Some of the many rules allowed by a type 2 grammar look like this. This new setup looks a lot like our old one, just with a couple of extra rules that make sure our sentences don't run them up with too many ifs or too few ors. With just a couple of extra more powerful rules, we're able to keep these pairs consistently matched up. And we can get a good sense of just how complex language has to be too, since now we can compare it to other type 2 languages. For instance, the artificial language of sentential logic, which we talked about a while back, falls into this class, along with most computer programming languages. And our x-bar rule for sentences does too, so we're all done, right? Well, not so fast. As it happens, there are patterns in language that can't be generated by these rules either. Take a sentence like, Charles says that we help John paint the house. Like we saw before, we can keep extending this sentence indefinitely. So, Charles says that we let the children help John paint the house. Charles said that we let Mary let the children help Peter help John paint the house, and so on. It's not a problem for English, since our existing rules are more than capable of handling it. But when we translate these sentences into a dialect of Swiss German, things get tricky. For one, the verbs let and help each need their own kind of specially marked noun phrase, an accusative one in the case of let and a dative one in the case of help. Overall, there need to be as many accusative nouns as there are lets and as many dative nouns as there are helps. And there's no upper limit to how many lets and helps there can be. What really throws a wrench into the works, though, is that in Swiss German, all of the nouns actually get grouped together at the front of the embedded clause, before all the verbs. To visualize what's going on, you can think of the overall pattern like this. Sandwiched in between the beginnings and ends of each of these sentences, we always find some number of accusative nouns, followed by some other number of dative nouns, followed by however many lets you need, followed by however many helps. And because of this bunching together of all the nouns and all the verbs, when we draw lines connecting each noun to each verb, those lines cross. For this reason, Swiss German is said to have crossing dependencies. And that's a real problem, since it can be mathematically proven that this kind of language can't be generated by a type 2 grammar. Check the video description if you want to know how. Because of that, we've concluded that natural language is at least mildly context sensitive. The rules of the next grammar up the list, so type 1, can reference context, and they generally look like this. And we've actually seen these kinds of rules already. When Chomsky was originally developing his theory of grammar, he proposed adding context-sensitive transformations to solve the problem posed here. In modern linguistics, this has taken the form of syntactic movement, something we now see just about everywhere, from question formation to raising verbs and more. So since natural language needs the type of rules that only type 1 systems or higher have, we know that's what we want. But what about type 0? Well, as it turns out, type 0 grammars end up being just too needlessly powerful to apply to human language, like using a supercomputer to do your taxes. Type 0 grammars have rules which are unrestricted, which means you can have any combination of symbols to the left of the arrow, and any combination of symbols on the right. There's no real template for these sorts of rules, except something like A to B, where A and B can be literally anything. So although we can make machines talk to each other with unrestricted grammars, when you line that up with what we know of natural languages, it just doesn't compute. That's why type 1 has just the right degree of complexity. So we've reached the end of the link space for this week. If you solved the enigma of language, you learned that we can think of a language like a set of rules that come together to generate all of its sentences, that we can rank those rules using the Chomsky hierarchy, and that human language lands somewhere in the upper half in terms of power and sophistication. The Ling Space is produced by me, Moti Lieber, and directed by Derevis Prévost. This week's episode was written by Stéphane Herdebis. Our editor is Georges Coulomb, our music is by Shane Turner, and our graphics team is Atelier Muse. We're down in the comments below. Or you can bring the discussion back over to our website, where we'll have some extra material on this topic. Check us out on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook, and try dropping by our store. And if you want to keep expanding your own personal link space, please subscribe. And we'll see you next Wednesday. Vivimos uscoro!